Andy Cromish, and I am delighted to welcome back Yvonne Wolf, who is going to be giving us a great presentation on the power of the Chinese zodiac. I want to thank the Levy Senior Center Foundation for sponsoring the lectures. Without them, we would not be able to uh, be gathered here like this. So thank you, Foundation. I also wanted to put a small plug in for the Evanston Roundtable. EvanstonRoundtable.com. It's our local newspaper here in Evanston. It's free and um, it's having a, um, a drive now to increase the number of uh, subscribers who receive its free uh, daily newsletter. Uh, it has all kinds of great information about what's going on in the city and it has lots of information and articles about the Levy Senior Center. So do yourself a favor and sign up. Okay, let me read uh, Yvonne's bio because she has an impressive array of uh, qualifications. Yvonne Wolf has a master's degree and she makes Chinese and East Asian cultures relatable and accessible to a wider audience. Taiwan born, educated in the United States and Europe. She is trilingual, fluent in English, Mandarin Chinese and Danish, which is a very unusual combination. And she has studied Japanese, Spanish and Greek. She has worked for 10 years as an HR, human resources trainer. She's lived in four different countries and she has visited more than 25 different countries. Um, she founded uh, Chinese Intercultural as a way of helping people uh, like myself, uh, possibly you, uh, to enhance our contact with e East Asian arts, culture, and people. Without any further ado, welcome back, Yvonne. We are delighted to have you. I will uh, remove myself from the screen as well as Kathy, and we will see you on the back end. Thank you, Wendy. It's a pleasure to return to Levy Foundation, and thank you for having me back. So this time we'll talk about the power of the Chinese zodiac. I'm very excited to read all the Q and A's and how many people already know their Chinese zodiac signs. So that is great start. So how? So this is Ni Hao. Uh, some of you might be familiar with that now. Now I would say 20 years ago nobody knows what Ni Hao could possibly mean, but it is a Mandarin greeting for hello. The power of the Chinese zodiac. Now, this is a very introductory conversation we'll have about the Chinese zodiac. So these are the four major questions we will be able to cover today. Now, I see the poll, the results of the poll. Is this still going on? I uh, no, I canceled it and don't even discount it. Everybody had problems with it because. Uh, but it's OK. It's OK. Yeah. Just let's get us to start thinking about it because I don't yes. want to yeah, start talking about something that People are trying to find out their Gemini or Pisces, and there's nothing to do with that. So I'm glad that people with this exercise, Wendy has put us in the right frame of mind, and that is all you need. You don't need to have studied before you come to this presentation. So I see that many of you, yeah, there's definitely people who know what they are, and I can tell you right now, I am a rooster. So what does that mean, though? Right? What does it mean to be a rooster or a monkey or to be um, a goat or a rat? Now, in the Western context, especially two years ago, this year is the year of the ox, last year was the year of the rat, many people said, wow, the year of the rat must be a bad year, right? Because rats are no good. But you know what? In the Chinese world, every animal has its strengths and power. There's areas that we can emulate in a positive way in this natural world. So you might see a little mouse or rat on the bottom of this slideshow, on the border of the slideshow. Well, he is part of 
this Chinese zodiac. So, so this, so the question. These are the four questions I'm going to cover today. Now, again, very cursory and introductory way of covering them. So, what is the Chinese zodiac? How does the Chinese zodiac differ from the Western horoscope? So we talk about Gemini, Pisces, I'm a Capricorn. <laughs> so uh, what does it mean when we talk about the rooster, as I am? So are there good or bad animals in the Chinese zodiac? And lastly, how does my zodiac animal impact my life? Now, you see these four general questions just help us to begin a conversation. And I found, I have found that in this past year, with all this strife going on within the United States, the best way we can contribute to a um, more hopeful future with our fellow countrymen is to have more conversations, not to stop talking, but just to have more things we can share, stories that we can begin to open up and understand each other. So these four questions, the first one is highlighted in purple because I don't want to lose you. So after every section, the, the title, the question will be highlighted so you know where I am. So now we will begin with what is the Chinese zodiac? Now, many of you might be familiar with this zodiac wheel that I'll show you on the next slide. In almost every Chinese restaurant, you might see this on, as a placemat and you have all these animals. Now, anybody already know how many animals there are? Well, there are 12. So here is this typical wheel you might have seen on your Chinese restaurant takeout placemat. Now, what does it mean? So let's start looking at this wheel. And first in the middle, you see a yin yang symbol. And this is a symbol of Taoism. Now Taoism is a very old tradition. It's a philosophy of Chinese way of looking at life. Now this philosophy is very old. Is older than Confucianism, is older than Buddhism. They tend to say that Taoism you know, came from this book and this and that book was began by a certain emperor. And I can give you an exact date, but I don't think that's really important because what Taoism really shows is a is a um, way of observation of the world of natural processes like the sun rises from the east and sits on the west now that is a Taoism observation so those things those things that Taoism compose of the philosophy is based on is older than any written document so it might be our connection to our cro magnum paleo people and well cavemen or in the end there are all those terms that you might be thinking of i don't know which one is correct politically correct now so so i'm throwing all of them out so those so that's why taoism all you need to know is that it's such an old old way of thinking of life as observing the nature that that we have inherited some of those rules of our nature so for example this is a, the, all 12 animals have been selected for some significant reason. And one of these reasons is that they all have some positive attributes that we can emulate. They are good virtues that we can try to be. And then they also have some that may be ways for us to develop ourselves as people. Now, the wheel turns because it starts on the rat and it's from this wheel, if you didn't know, you might not know who starts and what's the end and what, how does it go. So the first animal is the rat. This year, you see the oxen and we are now in the year of the ox. Now, before we get into like, oh, why is it an ox? Is it a cow? Is it a, a bison? In, if you have heard of an ox, a year of the ox, or a year of the bull, why is it sometimes different? Well, because Chinese language is such an old language. This language is contemporary with the hieroglyphics and the Mayan pictorial signs as well, that when we talk about, is it an ox or a cow? Is it a bull or a bison? Those questions are way 
too modern for us. So the Chinese character for this animal with two horns, that yeast grass, it covers everything from water buffaloes to bison to cows and and Jersey cows. So you see, so in for the, so for the purpose of the Chinese zodiac, it doesn't matter really if this is a spotted milk cow or it is a you know uh, what was it called fighting fierce bull. And then you have next year, we have the year the tigers coming up. And now you see rabbit, dragon, snake, horse, sheep, monkey, rooster, dog, and pig. So the pig is the end of this wheel. So you might wonder if there's a story with this. And yes, there is. Of course, all Chinese story, uh, cultural elements have stories behind them. So the first story I need to share with you is how did a rat become first. There, it is said that the cat and the rat were best friends. They share all foods and they went everywhere together. And then one day the emperor invited them all to a party. And he said, you are, all the animals in the kingdom are invited. Come and meet us on this, on us, this auspicious day. And so all the animals started traveling on this road to the emperor's party. The rat and the cat were best friends, right? They were brothers and the rat said, well, let's travel together because it can only be faster if we get there together. And so they went on this journey. And as they come all this way and they saw other animals were merging and also collected at this on this plateau, they saw there were there were oxen, there were tigers, all these animals, and then there was a river. To cross the river, well, the the <clears throat> the rat and the um, both the cat and the rat said they couldn't swim. So how could they do it? They were waiting, waiting on the bank of this river, just waiting to go over to that fantastic feast across the river. Then they saw that the ox was, was walking me and was, um, was strolling over, slowly lumbering over. And then the ox says, the water buffalo, <laughs> the water buffalo said, of course I can't go over there. Well, and the cat and the rat said, well, could you put us on your back? Because we can, neither of us can swim. So the oxen said, of course I can. And he lumbered into the water and had the cat and the rat behind him on his back. And just when they're crossing the river, now the rat was too smart for both animals. So this rat thought, I can cross faster if I could be the first one. So he pushed off the cat, off the back of the oxen and leapt forward so the rat was the first animal to make it across the river. And that's how he became the first of the 12 zodiac signs. And then the oxen made it, and then the tiger and all the other animals. But the cat, the poor cat, was struggling, splashing in the river. He just couldn't get himself out. And when he finally did, and he went back on his the original bank, that he was, he missed the party entirely. He missed this wonderful opportunity from the emperor to acknowledge every animal for their contribution to and their good uh, virtues. So the cat vowed that forever he and the rat shall be enemies and he will always be chasing that rat. So that is a story from <laughs> explaining a a phenomenon, a natural phenomenon based on a, a, a nice story of, 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 of a, um, poor friendship, how it ends to create enemies. Now, this might be amusing, and if you like to look this up, this has been an oral tradition that's passed on to many generations. There is an English copy that I will send um, to. Wendy after the program so you can look it up. So this just gives you a little story of how 
the rat became the first one. Now you might think that, oh, this, there's no any truth to the story. What could possibly could we get from the story? Well, for one thing, the rat is known to be a very smart animal. And even now, if you see, um, let's see, Tom and Jerry, and uh, Tom is always, Tom being the cat, is often fooled by the rat, Jerry. And so there is some truth to that. The rat is probably an animal of higher intelligence than the oxen or even the dog, if we think about it. And then you also, we also can talk about how maybe people might not understand why um, Mickey Mouse, right? A mouse has a dog, that's Pluto. And what is that funny relationship? How can a rat be bigger than a dog? So one of that possible relationship is again, is that the rat is probably a much smarter animal than our regular dog. So, so there is something to admire about the rat and we honor the rat in the sense that we want people to be smart like the rat. Think about the future. The rat is a very think, forward thinking animal. They're storing pack rat, they're waiting, they're prepared for winter. So those are the qualities that the zodiac sign picked the rat for. That Perhaps we people could be more forward thinking and more plan for this for the uh, winter and be thrifty and be resourceful and pick up any scrap and make a home out of it. So that makes the rat, even though people might think, oh, I don't like it. My, my, zodiac, my zodiac sign is a rat. That can't be good. Well, in the Chinese view, the rat is very good. The rat is very smart, it's thrifty, it's resourceful, and it has many good attributes. So, so that gives you an idea of the whole plan of the 12 animals. Now, next question I can address is how does the Chinese zodiac differ from the Western horoscope? So, First of all, you've probably already seen that the 12 animals is, does not fit in one year. The 12 animals represent one year at a time. So, and that year doesn't fit exactly to the Western calendar. So, so some of you, you're, if you are like me, have a January birthday, I always have to check if my animal is the beginning or the end of that zodiac sign. That's because the zodiac sign, the animal that we are looking forward to having and the one that's ending, it starts and ends on the lunar new year. So it's really by the lunar calendar, not the Western calendar. So that means if you're born on January 1st of this year, 2021, you're not an ox. The, the, um, the Lunar New Year this year fell in mid-February. So that means before February 15th, you are still at the end of what we call the rat, the, end, the tail end of the rat. And then um, starting from the um, February 15th and on, you are a true oxen, the head of the ox. And then this year will end, the oxen year will end on January 31st, 2022, and then February 1st will start the year of the tiger. So let's see how it differs besides that, besides how it doesn't fit neatly in this Western Gregorian calendar. So this calendar we're currently using today being um, September 28th, 2021, this calendar that we're using came a long way. It has a, it's been a long way in the making. And believe it or not, it was created as part of the Spanish Inquisition and the Western, the um, 
pro, um, pro Protestant revolts and very much the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment. The church, has, the Roman Catholic Church has everything to do with it. And I can't tell you the, the long answer because it takes about, I watched this incredible program, a Nova program that I explained in 45 minutes. But the point is that this calendar we have came from many failed calendars, many inaccurate calendars. And one of that, those calendars is the lunar calendar. The Chinese lunar calendar is one of those um, calendars that's not accurate enough, but for the time that it was created, it was the most powerful calendar there was. So we have to think about it relative terms in the in this correct context. So, for example, the lunar calendar has um, many. It follows the moon, and there are many other cultures who have a lunar calendar. You might be familiar with a Persian calendar, and even the Jewish calendar is based on the moon. Now, in the Western, we call it the Gregorian calendar. Current calendar is actually based on the sun, so it is a, it's a different perspective, but it definitely has its strengths. So the yin and yang of Taoism means that there's energy of of um, sun and the moon, and we knew that was part of our calendar, but then how does it really work? So for example, let me give you a simple example, and that is when we are in the past, let's think about in the olden days. In the olden days, do we really have a purpose for the word million? How about billion or trillion? If you think about it, the terms of billion, trillion only became useful within the last 20, 30 years. With computers or with stars, we need to count at the level of billions and trillions. But in the olden days, I'm not saying too far away, I'm talking about maybe even the 19th century, people did not count that high. They didn't go really by a 2021 20, calendar. In fact, the way people counted, like to know what year it is this year, they often rely on the reigning monarch. I know it's hard for Americans to think of a reigning monarch, but we do come from a tradition, a European tradition, where every a European country had an emperor, or no, not emperor, had a king or a queen, and using when that king's or queen's monarch's rise to power, their reign, that's how we know what year it is. So let me give you an example. And there's a point to this, is because that the Chinese calendar used the animals to make it easier to count. So let me give you an example of King George III, okay? Now that one's probably the one Americans have some relationship with. And his reign was 1760 to 1782, only 22 years. But during the time, and there's any history buffs out there might know that this is true, that this is how people used to start their diaries. They didn't say September 20, 28, 2021. They say, on the 28th of September, on the 10th year of King George III's reign, I grew a tomato. Okay, so something like this, um, I just want to point it out to you that that's how people really counted. People did not always use the 1760, 1782, um, because the con conceptually, that's a big number. Your average people in, in uh, even church uh, baptismal dates sometimes would use the year of a king's reign. So if you think about American Revolution started in, or we became a nation on 1776, historical records might say the American Revolution began upon the 16th year or ended on the 16th year of the King George III's reign. So that's how people really counted. And so using that system, um, it seemed very foreign to us now, but the Chinese used uh, uh, 
on the rat, the ox, that way just as well to count. So every time the rat came around, it was another 12 years. So for us right now, the year of the ox, it will not be the year of ox again for another 12 years. So using the animal, the zodiac, it helped people to count in a much more accurate way than they really have a concept for. So if you think right now, China is supposed to be in almost 5,000 years, and I can guarantee you, ask any Chinese person, they wouldn't know exactly what year it is. That's how obscure the number versus the animal. So let me use a more modern example. So let's see if the United States did not become independent, that we continue to be an English colony, what year would it be now? The Queen Elizabeth II, she started her reign in February um, 1952. So anybody out there, a British uh, buff or royal follower, um, if you do, this, this year is the 69th year of Her Majesty's reign. So we would think of today's date as September 28th, um, the 69th year of Her Majesty's reign. Now she has a unusually long reign. And so I didn't use her as a first example, just because it was actually long, hard to uh, count that high. But in the past, people used the monarch not just as sovereignty, as the representation of their country and nation, but also very much to track time. We couldn't do it, we couldn't track time without a monarch. Now that's how crucial it is. Now knowing that, using that comparison, how can I tell you about the, the, the um, use of Chinese zodiac in the Chinese culture? Well, this will give you a little more insight into how that works. For example, <laughs> The Chinese zodiac, like I said, we knew we always count by the animal and we knew what animal it was. So our children that are born on that year, and we know if it's at the tail end of a animal or the beginning of the animal. I was born in January, on January 6, 1970. So that brought me to be the tail end, the tail end of the rooster. Most of my classmates were dogs. Right? in the sense that they were born the year the dog. Now, so I knew in my, as an identity that I am a rooster and my other classmates were dogs. Now, in, what does that mean? That means that baby gifts for a newborn baby often has rooster or their, their animal sign motifs. And you might find that, well, what does that do? Why do you do that? Well, the people, so, so the Chinese zodiac is very much part of our identity as an Asian person that even sometimes before we're born. That means that my parents knew that I was going to land somewhere in the year of the rooster. And when my children were born, we knew that it was going to land, my child was gonna land somewhere in the year of the dog or so forth. And so that is the use of it. And then we use their signs to protect them. So I can show you an example. You can see on the camera. This is such a, a talisman. And this is, you might have seen this. Is this is a mouse, a rat or a mouse. And you have, might have seen this in Chinatown, sold in these little amulets. And they are talisman or, and they are, uh, they are made to protect the children. So, so a child in his first year of life was likely to receive a gift that tells them what animal they are. And then, as I mentioned before, that we use it to count. Now, how do we use it to count? Let me give you another example. It's very hard to forget what year your own children are born, right? But when it comes to 
my friends' children, my cousins' children. Sometimes I can't remember. Was it 2016? Was it 2015? Oh my goodness, let me see. Let me think what happened that year. You see, those days become easily very muddled and fuzzy. However, if we have a party on this on the baby shower and we uh for my um friend's baby on the year he was born there we gave them little talisman of snake because he was born the year of snake i will always remember that now because my that child as long as he's under 12 and he's a snake i know exactly what year he was born and then what else these Chinese zodiac signs are used for us to connect with our social relationships and even to assist with major life decisions. Now, let me just give you two brief examples. Social relationships, for example, I know my parents, my family, uh, and who are what sign by what animal. And again, that helps me to know what age they are, how, who was older, who was younger. So when it comes to my uncles and aunts, I know who is older than my mother or younger than my mother based on their zodiac signs. Many times I see many of my, my contemporary American friends, even my husband, he doesn't remember if his mother was the younger sister of his two aunts and my father-in-law had nine brothers and sisters. My my husband is not clear about who was older and who was younger. So this is how Chinese people keep track of our family social relationships. We will know who's older because if that uncle is a rabbit and the other uncle is a dog, so the rabbit must be older than the dog by the order of the wheel. And also it connects us in social relationships because in a family, if you have more than one rooster, as in my family, I know that my cousin who turned 60, the year I was 48, because we're both roosters, I know the year I turned 48, my aunt turned 72, also in terms of the 12 year birthdays. So that's how we know what, who we are and what our relationship is with that person. And with my, ch my child, who was also a rooster, well, I can't fool you. I didn't have my baby at 24. <laughs> so um, that's how he would know that I am exactly about or close enough 36 years older than him. So I, that's just some examples I like to give you of how we use it to count but as well as social relationships and then how about determining major life decisions well think about it how will you know uh, all these questions and all these big decisions we have to make for our children and our parents make for us where will we um, be best going to school what industry field of work should we go into oh let's say even when at the end of life, where would you be buried, let's say, when people pass? And who you should marry? What kind of company you should be working at? So these are major life decisions that Chinese struggle very much as well. So what do they do? They use the zodiac to figure out some of them, some of the ways that they can point them to at least a better, easier decision making. So if you're in a, if you're an animal that is considered very smart and, and hardworking, you might be steered towards engineering. Maybe you'll be steered towards working in construction. So there's all sorts of ways that that will help, the zodiac sign will help make major life decisions, such as who to marry. Now the most example, the most typical example is who would you marry? And the signs played a significant role much more in the past than it does now. So in the past, before people even meet, they would look at the signs compatibility and because if they're incompatible, they shouldn't meet at all. That was the logic. And now it's a lot less pressure on your particular sign and whether these are compatible 
uh, zodiac animals. But we'll go into that more after we cover a little more ground. So some social expectations can lead to self-fulfilling prophecies. So for example, if we think all children born in the year of the hare or bunnies are shy, then we would tend to encourage our shy bunnies to get over their shyness and push them towards, oh, public speaking or, or do some kind of show and dance or something to get over that particular weakness, but it may not be true. So maybe that, that uh, child does, isn't shy, but then given the opportunity, they become a braver and stronger bunny personality. So, so that you can see that how some of these, these um, um, characteristics that we may associate with certain animals can actually lead us to believe that's how that animal is and that's how that person must be. So don't take it too seriously, but I'll give you some of some typical ways that Chinese zodiac uh, is used in the Chinese culture. So here I show you once already, there's a, uh, the year of the rat, something we were a talisman we often give to children on their birthdays. And also this is, for example, a pig. I don't know if you can see, this is a little piece of jade that's cut in the shape of a little pig. And here I have one that is um, a dog. And you see that the left side on this slide, I show you many more. So there's 12 all together. Each animal have these carvings and we keep them with this child for protection so that their animal would protect them in, in, uh, in everything they do. And then you see this horse statue and this tall horse statue, this would often be seen in a Chinese park. So if, if you think about it, if Millennium Park is in China or a Chinese speaking country, there will be a cement horse. There will be, and if you see a horse, you bet there will be 11 other animals. So there will be 11 other zodiac animals in this statue. It's typical in those parks that children gather by their animal. And you take a picture next to your animal to celebrate that connection. So that is one of these cultural elements that you might find uh, in a Chinese speaking country where you would not see it here. Or if you saw a horse here, it doesn't mean there's 11 other animals. But in, in a Chinese speaking country, you bet there will be all 12 animals. If you didn't have 12 animals, they have to fix it. They have to make sure there's 12 because there will, people, there will be people who will complain. There will be the uh, people who say, what's wrong with your um, ox? Why is it missing a horn? Okay, go fix it. So that's the kind of funny things that will definitely happen if you don't take care of your parts that way. And then you see the bottom, I have, I show you these are little purses and backpacks for children in shapes of pig, dog, and ox. And guess what? There's nine other animals. You will never um, be in the store where there's just one animal and not the others. It's just uh, bad for business, you see? And if you, and if you are a, person, let's say if you are an ox, but you just happen to like dogs, the shopkeeper will say, no, if you're an ox, you, here, I have all the ox stuff. <laughs> they will not understand why you would want to buy a dog coin purse instead. So that is part of that Chinese culture where people are so used to uh, collecting their own animals that they will even find it odd and curious hmm, that you want to collect someone else's animal. It just doesn't seem to make sense. So the, now I hope you have a little background on how it differs from the Western horoscope because the in the Chinese world, in the Chinese context, it's definitely a closer relationship and identity um, that um, people would have conversations and it's a small talk opener. Whereas um, I don't assume that any 
you know, uh, my fellow Americans would know their zodiac signs in the Chinese system. And then in the Chinese system, because there's so much that we know about our animals, that there's something that we almost inherit from them in a, you know, in a um, self-fulfilling way. So let me, now let's get to the, uh, are there good or bad animals? I get this question a lot. So let me give you a short answer and I'll tell you why. Are there good zodiac animals or bad ones? Because nobody, right, nobody in the Western world wants to be a snake in the grass or a rat. And I have also heard during the year of the pig that some people told me, oh, I don't like my animal. I don't want to be a pig. Who wants to be a pig? Well, in the Chinese zodiac, the pig is a good animal. In fact, there is no bad zodiac animal. And you see here, this is our cute ox for the year 2021. The Chinese zodiac signs were used as a calendar. So think about that. In the calendar, there is no bad signs, right? Pisces or Taurus or the, um, or the um, let me see, the Capricorn. They are all good signs, right? Now, in the, in the Chinese world, in the Chinese world, there is no bad time to have a baby. So all babies are welcomed in the year they, they arrive to us. It's always a blessing that babies arrive. And so there is no bad animal. But there are some that's more preferable than others. So let me give, just give you a, the order of the animals again. And this is from the rat. You see, go, they follow the arrows that the next one's the oxen. And then after the ox is the tiger. After tiger, you have the rabbit and then, or the hare. Remember rabbit and hare, these English distinctions really matter very little to Chinese. The Chinese character and the signs that they came up with was very pre-Darwinian. So they don't matter to a Chinese uh, mind. So we have the rabbit comes, after rabbit comes the dragon, after dragon comes the snake. Then you have the horse and the, again, goats and sheep makes no difference in the Chinese world. Um, because the sheep, if you think of the woolly uh, sheep uh, uh, from Ireland, those kind of sheep didn't exist in the Asian world. So there is only the goat in the original context. And you'll see that this is a mug that's made to celebrate the goat. And there's nothing sheepish about it. And after the sheep, you have the monkey, and you have the rooster, and then dog, and then pig that ends it. So what do I mean by some animals are more preferable than others? Now, you know that in in the West, now I know when my, one of my children was born in December, my uh, OBGYN actually offered to have me induce this baby because she, my doctor, was going on vacation. So she's going on vacation for Christmas and she said, you know what, I can, you know, we can induce this baby or we can have a cesarean and then we're both on vacation. I said, hmm, I'd rather wait as when nature calls. So I did not say yes to that. Now imagine in the Eastern world, in Asia, you would be induced or offered to be induced for other reasons. And that reason not necessarily coincide with Christmas holidays or Easter holidays, or more likely that, look here, if you have a baby that is due to arrive on the end of the rabbit, okay, but, um, I'm sorry, yeah, if, yeah, or the due to arrive, I'm sorry, was a better example, um, they will, um, they want you to, let's say the end, let's say end of the dragon, let's say, okay, the year, the end of the dragon, but the year is ending. And then the next year would be the snake. Well, if you induce this delivery, you, you get a dragon. Would you prefer a dragon or a snake? Yes, even the Chinese, the Chinese world loves dragons. So they will definitely say yes to that, inducing the baby. Now, how about between horse and goats? 
Would you prefer a horse or a goat? Well, more people prefer a horse than a goat. And then when it comes to goats and monkeys, the monkey is more considered more clever and more uh, creative an animal than the goat. So there you go. There are some of these preferences that may seem odd to you, but very logical to the East Asian world. So for example, this dragon is the only animal in the 12 zodiac sign that is mystical. All the other animals are real and exist and they, many are edible, <laughs> but the dragon is the most mystical of them all. In a Freakonomics study, if you have any fans out there of Freakonomics, there's actually an episode on, on bringing about based on the year of the dragon. In East Asia, there is a huge um, yeah, a huge uh, climb in birth rates during the year of the dragon. And you might think that, why would they do that? Is it just, you know, people who are uh, ignorant or country folks or people who are, don't know um, anything? In fact, no. Actually, this economic study showed very true and very modern studies show that it's even people who have PhDs, doctors, uh, people who are very well educated, and they are doing the same thing. They're putting off their pregnancy or getting married earlier just so that they can have a baby that's a year of the dragon. In fact, this study in the economics show that in America, that East Asian babies tend to have a, a spike also in the United States. It's not as obvious as in East Asia because it, it, the number kind of gets hidden by all the other babies that's born that year. However, in East Asia, and I'm talking about Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, not just China, and all these, Thailand, all these Asian countries, you'll see a huge um, spike on the year of the dragon, so much so that teachers have to be hired just for those years, and the teachers will kind of follow those children in their in their um, in the course of their education. Uh, housing becomes a problem. Uh, <laughs> in fact, um, college entrances is a tougher to get in on um, dragon years, and every one of these countries, the government say. Please don't do that. Please do not observe the year of the dragon because it does create a lot of problems in East Asia. So, so do you think there's uh, other animals that are just as desirable? Well, the, the dragon probably tops it all. However, most people are not going to wait to have a baby or hold on to 12 years of not having a baby. So the other years will, you will see some normalcy, but around the year of the dragon, you will see some crazy numbers of people having babies. And then the other two animals are equally or less, or the number two, the runner ups are the top favorite animals. We have a horse, we have uh, horses, and we have tigers. Now, tigers used to be. And my, I would say when I was young, so good um, 40 years ago, that tigers used to be seen as, well, it's all good if you're a boy. You know, if you're a girl and you're a tigress, good luck finding a husband. <laughs> and the, the compatibility when it comes to a female tiger versus all other animals are considered so bad that many girls who are born the year of the tiger were doomed to spinsterhood. Now, in our modern years, in the last 20 years or so, I would say that has, thank goodness, declined in popularity. So nowadays, tigers, girl, boy, are just as desirable. Uh, there's no um, problems with being, you wouldn't have to hide your year of birth or uh, hide your sign so that you could be properly married. 
And so lastly, the last part of the answer I can give you on this, are there any bad zodiac animals? Well, there's no bad zodiac animals, but there's only bad zodiac animal combinations. Now this, even this, I would say, take it with a grain of salt. I personally don't subscribe to this, but I need to tell you that a great majority of people who come from East Asian heritage might subscribe to this and might uh, might believe this in more in whole in more um, um, in more um, eagerness than me. Okay, so let me to show you how that could be. So so how does the zodiac animal impact your life? Well. In East Asia, if you were working for a company in East Asia, and let's say, imagine this, they have a project. They have a project that they want to implement, and they get a group of people together. And this group would be, let's say, 10 people. And then the project, you know, they, there's bumps in the road, there's ups and downs, and there's people planning, working together, and people can, um, sometimes they have friction with each other, or sometimes they feel like, hey, this project's not going the way I really want it to go. Well, then some people, the leader, the senior management might come over to this project group and say, let me see, let me see, what, what sign are you guys? He'll take a look at all 10 of you and might say, Oh my gosh, we've got too many tigers in here. That's the problem. So I'm going to switch out uh, you there, uh, you there. Well, you have to move on to another group and then we'll bring in a couple of rabbits and we'll bring in a, a couple of dogs because dogs get along with everybody. And that would be the solution. <laughs> now you might think that how silly, how incredible that they would look at your sign and determine what you do. Well, culturally speaking, none of the people would disagree because they're used to that in this um in the east asian world if you're in a group that um, your signs are being considered constantly well they do impact your life they might be the reason you get promoted they might be the reason you get assigned to a better project they might be a reason why you're taken out of a project so do people believe in destiny in east asia Sure, they do because it does matter in social relationships. But when it comes and when it comes to how your zodiac animal impact your life, thank goodness it has less bearing here in this country. Um, so that means people signs when they look at marriages, uh, they will look at what the signs are. And then if you are uh, having trouble with your spouse, they would also like you to consider your um, the strengths and the strengths and weaknesses of your animal, and perhaps you can work towards those particular traits. So if you are, you already found your sign, and there's a second link that helps you come uh, find your compatibility. Now, if you um, that link maybe it's a little bit of a problem. I can share my um, my screen. Let me share my screen with you, perhaps. And I can show you, yeah, here, this is the way. So there, here is a matrix <laughs> of the, all the animals. So you will go down from this table. If you yourself is a rat, so let's say, see, Wendy and I work wonderfully together. And she told me she's a rat. And look down here, rooster. It tells us we're a big X. That means we are... We're the worst possibility, worst combination. Obviously, it can't be true <laughs> because she and I work fabulously together. So I just wanted to show you how uh, this matrix has some function, but in all good fun. Please don't um, believe with, with your whole heart. It's more of a funny thing to start conversations and maybe I'll get you a date <laughs> but uh, a good combination would be would be a good reason to go out on a date and I can stop sharing here and go back to my slide
and then I want to end the, this conversation, this, end this talk on a happy note. Now, why do the Chinese say life begins at 60? As you know, the, the animal you're born with, you start with um, the first time that you are born. And, but then that year, you don't know anything about it, right? Nobody is aware or conscious of their animal the year they're born. However, the first time it comes cycles back, you're 12. And that year, that's when we really know who, uh, what year it is, right? What 12, you're starting to know your parents' birthdays, all these things that you know where you are in your family. Well, at 24, many people are already married with children. They've already met their, um, their um, spouse and, and the person they were going to be with. Now, but at 12, this is a time that we don't even know um, how to talk to people, right? Awkwardness, the teenage, and uh, maybe, yeah, well over not finding a homecoming dance partner or a date as my kids just went through homecoming and um, du duly rejected from many girls they asked uh, to go out with on this <laughs> homecoming date. Um, but then by 24, you're already in your life. You have maybe your mother and or a father and then by 36 you probably have some kind of career you know what your profession is and by 48 maybe your kids are already out of your house and so these are significant times in your life and they end at 60. with many times that we the, the fifth being the fifth rotation is at 60 i mean not end but um so now 60 used to be a very high number nobody expected to get there so the 60 is a way to encourage people to think oh if you are worried about getting a date if you're worrying about um your career you worry about finding a house don't worry about it you you it'll, It'll all, you'll know what to do when you turn 60. Because by the time your fifth rotation, it's encouragement for you to, by the time you're 60, you would know all those woes of being a teen and you have overcome it. You would know the woes of being newlywed or have being a new father or a new mother, but then you'll know how to handle that now. And so, by the, so and then in your 30s, you'll know how to talk to your boss. You'll know how to talk to your subordinate. And perhaps that by, and that's the idea that life begins at 60 is that by the time you're 60, you will know how to handle all the problems of your younger age. And that's the time you're ready, really ready for life. So my final message is I hope you use your zodiac traits to make you a better person. Don't let your zodiac limit who you are. I'm very glad to be here again with you, and I hope I, I, uh, we can continue to have more conversations about um, Chinese and East Asian cultures. So that gonna... was great. So okay. interesting. We have lots of, well, we have a few questions. Um, so let me see. And my screen perhaps and they'll make it easier for us to see. Okay, great. So Connie would like to know, and thank you very much by the way, um, how, is the Chinese lunar calendar the same as the Jewish lunar calendar? No, no, no. Yes, they're not, uh, they're not the same, but they um, definitely have um, come a long way. So I, I don't know, there might be some overlap because there are some um, studies, right, that go back a few thousand years to, um, to look at the similarities. Okay, uh, let's see. Alice says, although I was born in the year of the rat, I have an affinity for tortoises and turtles. Is there a connection in Chinese culture between the two? Well, the tortoise, okay, is a hugely significant animal in Chinese culture. So that would, it doesn't fall in the zodiac, but the tortoise is considered a magical animal. It has, uh, well, 
in the Chinese writing, the Chinese, um, I guess, the uh, ideograms actually started on etching on turtle backs. So they use the turtle like the turtle shell, like a uh, blackboard. Okay, so is that kind of usefulness? Um, but if the turtle definitely has some magical qualities to it because it is one of the oldest living animals. A turtle can easily live to 80 years old. So it's um, so it definitely is considered a wise and very um, like a, a animal with longevity and stamina. Very interesting. Okay, Cynthia would like to know how do wood, iron, and iron interact with the 12 year cycle? Okay, so this is something I, I didn't go into because I think in the beginning there's so much to to open your uh, thoughts to, it might get too complicated. Uh, so this is how it works, okay. The, the five, right? The five times your animal returns. Each time, let's say the um, animal returns, it's, it's got a one of the dirt, the soil, uh, iron, water, fire um, notation to it. So this year is a metal ox, for example, the metal ox. So then the next one would be, I'm not, I, I'm not versed enough to tell you, but it's one of the water, the soil, ox, and so forth. So the, the time you actually come back to a metal ox, that is after the five rotations. And that's the 60. Right, that, and that creates the number 60. Okay. So again, using that system to count is what really is significant. So at one point, when Chinese calendars, at every 60 years, the cycle, they come back, you see, to so all the animals, they come back to that again. And so if someone was interested in learning what element um, corresponded to the year that they were born, how would they do that? Well, they can Google it now much easier than before. Okay. <laughs> you really have to look into a um, yeah, fortune teller or ask a fortune teller, you know, a true Chinese calendar, and then somebody has to read it for you. But now it's all Google. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the uh, and people, I will, uh, I will share the um, the link to the uh, website that Yvonne gave uh, that determines what your animal sign is, as well as the uh, compatibility, the Zodiac com compatibility chart. I will include those in the follow-up emails. Uh, but Doris would like to know, uh, what's the reference for that? Is, uh, I don't know who, which oh. company produced it or how did it? Um, well, the Chinese calendar is very old and there's people who actually, um, they, they know how to adjust it. Okay, so they, so there, it's actually, when I was a child, it was actually a book, like it's issued every year, like the Farmer's Almanac. okay? They, you, you can buy it in a store, okay? <laughs> there's a calendar you buy. Uh, but then uh, there are also calendar that you buy that hang on the wall that shows you what day it is in Chinese calendar. So the Chinese calendar uh, was, um, it ran, and then now, of course, we're in America. So the Chinese American calendar has everything, the American holidays, and then the Chinese days along, run parallel to it in smaller print, but that's what it does. Okay. Uh, so, so I hope that helps you to understand how it works. Um, I mean, you know, people who use Greek calendars, boy, they need to know like a name state. Now we can just Google it, but there is a Greek calendar, right? That you can find, oh, that's my name's day. And then when's my child's name's day, they come up like that. So you actually need a calendar that has this markings. I hope that. Okay, great. Um, so I'm curious, uh, does this come into play when people are running for elected office in China or East Asian yeah. countries? Definitely, definitely. It has a lot of, um, yes, what we think of a leadership position role, they, yes, that does. And also uh, with you, now we get into more of a Chinese calendar. So it's, it's almost a different topic because you know, this is a very, 
I think is these are all conversation starters. Like I said, this is a long, huge topic about the zodiac. So this is just a beginning. Um, but definitely, when you get into the calendar part, there are, in the Chinese calendar, there are good days, there are bad bad days. And if you want to get married on a date that's incompatible with the Chinese calendar, even if you yourself you say I don't care, and your husband doesn't care, and they say we just want this date. Well, your wedding guests would be calling you and and telling you, do you really want to have it that day? <laughs> okay, and even the hotel staff, if you are booking through a venue, they don't let you just choose your date. They'll say, no, that date is really not good. Can we offer you a better date? So that's how funny it is. The culture will kind of steer you that way, even though you say, ah, I don't care. We're just going to go with this. And then the, uh, you'll find a lot of people uh, talking, talking, talking to you until you change your date. <laughs> so, so that's part of the fun and the, and the headaches of being uh, part of another culture. That is pretty funny. Uh, let's see. Um... Uh, so Felicia would like to know, um, did you go, did you purchase a, those talismans on Argyle Street in uh, yeah. Chicago? Yeah, they're available at all sorts of Chinatowns. You know, they are, they're fun. You know, I always, I try. Is there a particular place you recommend or? Oh, no, no. I mean, nowadays with so many stores, you know, being closed or it's like this past year it was very hard for me to find a little you know rats you know the last year i mean 2020 that i bought them on on, on uh, amazon so but uh, yeah so i have uh, for example uh, on my neighbor she said that she has an asian friend who was having a baby and she, or having a, yeah having a baby and she wasn't sure if they are into all this i said well then if you give them a little bib with Mickey Mouse for year 2020, I bet they'll think it's really cute. <laughs> and, and sure enough, that was a winner <laughs> for, for a baby gift. That's really funny. Okay, um, that pretty much sums it up. We didn't have that many questions. Um, uh, I'm X-I-E, X-I-E, is that? Yes, yeah, that means thank you. Oh, okay. Alice says thank you. Oh yes, I hope you enjoy this. I mean, it's a it's it's a lot to kind of to see uh, from that perspective from the uh, Chinese calendar. But I hope you uh, have some interest now in it, and you have more questions, and and it piques your curiosity. And I hope absolutely. You um, Yvonne, before you go, can you uh, just give little uh, give a little tidbit about some of the other um, programs that you offer? Yes, I'd love to. Well, this past summer, I did um, several programs for um, for the um, introduction to the East Asian Garden. So that was uh, very well received. On no, Zoom, it was just a, a slideshow, but I was able to lead a group, for example, to Ping Tong Park in Chinatown on a walking tour. And this walking tour is much I think more fun and more interactive way of showing you an East Asian garden. I also did a tour with um, Chicago Botanic Garden or at uh, Chicago Botanic Garden through the Women's Exchange. So I am open to that kind of. Uh, OK, yeah. well, that's yeah. that's not something we'd be able to facilitate here. But, um, you know, if, if we were to do another program, what are some of the topics that you would offer? Well, uh, let's see, there is a birds and blossoms in Chinese paintings. That is something very popular. Um, a lot of Chinese um, paintings of palm blossoms and birds, you might have seen them even on the box of uh, Chinese takeout food it has little birds and flowers on it. So I, I love to discuss how that is meaningful in itself. I also do, I've done a talk on jade, on jade symbols and, and uh, uh, secret little messages of joy and happiness that's represented in jade carvings. Um, I also, let's see, um, let's see, uh, I do a tea demonstration and that is, yeah, that would be probably better in person. Yeah. Um, on the Zoom yeah, platform, 
the yes paintings i there's a two part to the painting that um discussion one is that bird and blossom the other topic is mountain and water and those motifs are very common in chinese arts and even korean paintings and japanese paintings and i just love to share that with you and some understanding of what those symbolizes so how about um alice is asking about chinese music or um flower arranging i know the the um yeah anything like that well flower arranging i don't do uh, but um music i have been preparing one for uh, music and uh, i also let me see i also prepare one for what was it yes an introductory on the on on that um and well, and then also on the four gentlemen in Confucius, you know, Confucius um, symbolism in Confucius philosophy. There's uh, the four, as in plum blossom, irises, um, bamboo, and chrysanthemum. So those are symbols that you might be familiar with, um, and they appear also in flower arrangement right now autumn you might see a lot of chrysanthemums and they they are definitely um, a meaningful flower in chinese culture and since you mentioned bamboo it makes me think of mahjong that oh you i do i do i do do a talk on the um yeah on the story behind the bam bams cracks and uh let's see was it bams, cracks, and that's so, so for that one is um if someone doesn't know how to play mahjong uh will that affect how much they enjoy that uh presentation so. yeah i don't think so because i've met people from my presentation who don't know how to play but they remember it from let's say their mothers used to play or they knew people who played or they're familiar with the sound of them the tiles clashing together so i thought that was a very uh, nice um yeah sentiment that I share as well. Okay, great. Um, great. Yeah, we are, oh yeah, I forgot. Do we, I didn't talk about the Chinese food. I've done a, a presentation on, it's called soup, egg roll, stir fry and fried rice. And it's all about the cultural elements in your regular takeout and the Chinese food that we have here. Okay. that. Um, that sounds tempting. Maybe one to better have at a restaurant, but. Oh, yeah. The only warning is that will make you very hungry. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you also do one on, um, I, I don't think you mentioned this, the Chinese philosophies. Yes, uh, that is. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I, I did it once with Buddhism, Confucianism and um, Taoism. Yeah, it is a, it's a little hefty. Yeah, I noticed that it's a little tough to cover so many bases, um, but Confucianism, you know, as a start, maybe a good two part with, um, yeah, with, with uh, other philosophies. Okay, great. So, Henry. Yvonne, thank you so much. It was lovely to see you again, and we all learned a lot. Uh, folks, uh, next we or in two weeks, we're going to be having uh, Peter Moscos, who is, uh, he was born and raised in Evanston. He is now a professor at John Jay College, um, John Jay College of what? Uh, hang on. John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And uh, he wrote this book, Cop in the Hood, about the year that he spent as a police officer in Baltimore. This was before he went to Harvard to complete his PhD in sociology. And he now writes and teaches about criminal justice. And um, he's going to have a fascinating presentation. He has a new book coming out and uh, he's going to discuss the uh, change in New York, uh, New York's crime rate uh, during the 90s. And um, that should be really interesting. And I know we'll have lots of questions 
uh, to ask him about what's going on now since the murder rate is spiking. Um, and he, he, is, he just has lots of really interesting opinions and he's local, he, he grew up in Evanston. So uh, his second, uh, another one of his books is In Defense of Flogging. I borrowed this from the Evans, uh, one of the libraries, and um, it's a very provocative topic and read, uh, look into it if you want to um, just think about something that you probably haven't thought of before. So that's it. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Yvonne, thank you again. It was really lovely. And uh, we will uh, look for the follow-up link later this evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Levy Senior Center Foundation. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Have a great week, people. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.